San Onofre, like uh, most other power plants in the last 10, 15 years, has been using what is called high burnout fuel. Uh, reduce the number of refuelings, so allow longer operation without stopping nuclear power plants. And so as a result, the fuel rods are hotter. Uh, after 10 years, the fuel rods are about twice as hot uh, thermally as, as um, in terms of uh, thermal power generation as they would be with low burnout fuel. Uh, San Onofre seems to have exceeded the, the highest burnout here seems to have exceeded the levels that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission seems to speak about in their environmental impact statement uh, in terms of worrying about disposal. So that's kind of a mystery and I wondered whether San Onofre had explicit authorization to exceed the 62.5 gigawatt day per ton limit. I'm Arjun Makijani, I'm president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Um, most people don't realize that once a nuclear power plant is shut operationally for power generation, um, a large part of the risk still remains. Uh, we're more aware of it since the Fukushima accident, but I think Robert Alvarez and I were the first, after the Fukushima accident commenced, to call attention to the spent fuel pools at that site. And there are, of course, spent fuel, two spent fuel pools still operational at the San Onofre site, and there's a fair amount of dry storage. All of the Unit 1 uh, casts are in dry storage. Uh, there are usually, when people have calculated the risks from fuel pool fires, uh, they have attended to the cesium-137 source term because cesium evaporates. It was the thing that was emitted most at Chernobyl and also at Fukushima to the air after the explosions there in 2011 uh, in terms of the long-lived radionuclides. Uh, but there's also another danger which is now becoming manifest at Fukushima, which is uh, that strontium-90, which is present in very similar amounts in spent fuel, is not volatile, so it doesn't evaporate when there's a fire, uh, but it is present and in contact with water, it is more easily mobilized from the spent fuel. So if you look at some of the Fukushima numbers now, um, you see that groundwater is more contaminated, some samples at least, with strontium-90, many times more contaminated than with cesium-137. And this site, of course, is similar to the Fukushima site in the, in the sense that it's on the ocean, and so if there is a spent fuel pool fire due to an accident or, or uh, a terrorist attack, then uh, you also have uh, damaged spent fuel where strontium-90 may be exposed to runoff, rain, storms, fallout, and so on, and, and be, um, not, not fallout, uh, runoff and rain and storms. And therefore, you might get ocean contamination with strontium-90, which, which bioaccumulates quite strongly in, in, in fish and bones and so on. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing that I've become more and more aware of over the last year is that San Onofre, like uh, most other power plants in the last 10, 15 years, has been using what is called high burnout fuel. That is, how much energy do you produce out of uh, the fuel rods that you put in? And this has been allowed to uh, reduce the number of refuelings so allow longer operation without stopping nuclear power plants. And so as a result, the fuel rods are hotter. Uh, after 10 years, the fuel rods are about twice as hot uh, thermally as, as um, in terms of uh, thermal power generation as they would be with low burnout fuel. Uh, San Onofre seems to have exceeded the, the highest burnout here seems to have exceeded the levels that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission seems to speak about in their environmental impact statement uh, in terms of worrying about disposal. So that's kind of a mystery, and I wondered whether San Onofre had explicit authorization to exceed the 62.5 gigawatt day per ton limit. San Onofre also going to confront some very strong dilemmas. People agree that dry storage is generally safer than spent fuel pool storage. Uh, each dry cask has smaller amounts of radioactivity, much smaller amounts of radioactivity. By my calculation, a similar fire in a dry cast to a spent fuel pool would, would cause about 1.5% of the 
emissions as a swoop, a dry cast fire that released 10% of its radioactivity would cause about 1.5% of the emissions compared to a similar scale fire in a pool, where there's much more radioactivity in the pool. But for high burn-up fuel, the NRC has allowed, allowed high burn-up fuel without thinking about long-term storage. It's not clear to me, uh, because there is no real data on whether longer-term storage in spent fuel pools is better or worse than longer-term storage in dry casks. And finally, because we don't have a geologic repository, uh, the NRC is now thinking that there may be on-site storage for hundreds of years or maybe forever and that we would have to tr transfer from one dry cask to another as they wear out and nobody has considered, the NRC has explicitly said we don't really know how to transfer damaged spent fuel from one cask to another in response to a petition uh, from Minnesotans. Uh, and they said, we'll worry about that when we come to it, because we will know the fuel is damaged. Well, there are 95 damaged fuel assemblies that are already stored at San Onofre. So we know there are damaged fuel assemblies. And the NRC doesn't seem to be very eager to deal with it. And finally, I think it's very important for us it, who oppose nuclear power and don't think it's very sensible I don't think it's sensible to make plutonium just to boil water and spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, that you put a limit to the amount of spent fuel we generate, but, but we also need to think through what we're going to do about geological repositories because we've had a terrible failed program in this country. Thank you.